Let's start with a small prayer. Keeping your head, neck, back erect. Let's try to relax your body. Bring your focus to all the thoughts converging at one single point now. Moving further more subtle, be aware of your buddhi, the intellect, which is stable, steady, and strong enough to grasp things. Bring in quietitude. Quietitude in your mental layer. And staying in this wonderful wholesomeness, we shall chant three Omkaras. Dhyana Shloka, please listen. Om Partha Ya Pratibodhita Bhagavata Narayane Swayam Vyasena Grathita Purana Munina Madhi Mahabharatam Advaitam Vritavarshini Bhagavati Ashtadashadhyayini Ambat Tvamanu Sandhadhami Bhagavad Gite Bhavad Veshini Simple bombing. In the previous class, we understood Padam Gachanti Anamayam. How without attachments, how do we attain a state of trouble freeness, a state of Upadrava free, a state of problem free. And in in line with that. We are continuing 2.52. Yadate moha kalilam. Yadate moha kalilam. Buddhir vyati tarishyati. Buddhir vyati tarishyati. Tada ganta sinir vedam. Tada ganta sinir vedam. Shrutavyasya shrutasya cha. Shrutavyasya shrutasya cha.
Moha Kalilam. That's the catchphrase here. We'll take this word Moha Kalilam and understand what it is. Moha means delusion. Kalilam means the taint, the impurity. As Bhashagara, as Shankaracharya, rightly identifies this Kalila to be the impurity. What is this impurity that he is talking about? What is the root cause of all moha? Root cause of all delusions? Which faculty in us make us deluded? What is that which makes us deluded? Why couldn't we think properly? Why couldn't we understand or perceive the reality properly? It is because of the frail entity that we have got, ego. Hmm? Ego is not being rude. Ego is not pride. Ego is not being jealous. Ego is that which says that this is me. This body is me. This career is mine. This wealth, this asset is mine is acquired by me. All these information put together is the root cause of all delusions. This is what ego signifies. Patanjali rightly points out five different causes of misery in this world. What are those five? Avidya. The first one is avidya. Avidya meaning ignorance. What is that we, we ignore? It is not that we ignore or it is not that we do not know. It is not the unknown that is being pointed out here. It is the lack of realizing our own self. The inability to realize our own self. That is ignorance. The second cause of misery he points out as asmita. Why are we incapacitated to realize ourselves? Why don't we know ourselves? Or why do we have this information? Oh my God, don't I know me? I know me myself. I can. And I know me. I am a professor. I am a carpenter. I am a barber. I am such and such a person's wife, husband, child. So all these misapprehensions, so-called misapprehensions, are caused by asmita, ego. Why? Because ego is that constant faculty, the faculty inside which constantly gives you the message that I am this, I am this, I am this. Lately, perhaps it was this morning, someone was talking about self-love. And then I stand corrected her <laughs> that self-love is not uh, loving oneself and making up or, or or getting ready or, or dressing up nice or doing all those things that you desire for, you accomplish the desires. It's not self-love. Self-love is love for self. What is self here? See, the, the ego is that strong that it always points you that it is your body. If you're going to Please your body, please your mind, you you love yourself. <laughs> no? And then uh, the person was also sent, you know, giving an giving a argument. I should say it is a healthy discussion. But the, the basis of the argument was 
look you are always in one different tangent one different dimension and then you're you're thinking about it like that but uh, it is just just mere self love no, no what is mere self love there is no dimension or tangent in it when we are aware that we are not this body or the mind there is no tangent or dimension it is complete wholesomeness see um let me give the same analogy um guru shankaracharya das rajju sarpavate no he he says uh, a person who mistakes the rope to be a snake he gets all the question oh my god it's a snake is it a viper or a cobra is it going to kill me it is going to is it going to be powerful does it does it have the venom or is this venomless snake do should i kill it or not kill it oh my god it's it is going to be against my religion oh i'm not a, i'm above all religions i should first take care of myself all those questions all those troublesome thoughts that you got is only because of the misapprehension that you mistook rope to be the snake all these problems all these desires all these questions all these thoughts are because of misapprehension and he goes to the point saying that the entire creation of trouble creation of misery creation of this samsara this world is because of this misapprehension asmita patanjali does not stay here he goes a bit far because of asmita what happens he gives the other two the 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 duo of uh, emotions raga and dvesha 3 and 4 to be the cause of the misery raga being strong likes strong attachments is this what i like you know i like a person who is dynamic i like a person who is who is righteous who talks nice who presents himself as like decent <laughs> strong attractions um and the the, the fourth one being dvesha the hatred you know often when i talk to people about this then they say we don't have any strong emotions we don't hate anyone we love no one we are very neutral but <laughs> but the point behind raga they are always you know twin brothers and sisters these raga and dvesha if you have one you will definitely have the other huh? if you pinch one the other one cries you know so something like that so if you if you like a person for some reason you will find a person who has an unlikable character completely opposed to the previous one you will definitely hate him for example uh if you like your house to be clean and tidy you move into a place where it is you know a bit messy and chaotic will first try to change the place why why so even the point of fact that i am tidy i am clean it is also it also leads to the affliction mental affliction that we hate untidy places isn't that not a uh, basic basic stuff it is basic you know every human wants to sleep on a clean bed every every person wants to be on a clean place this is basic why why do you uh, crib about it i crib about it because even basic cleanliness can become um can become extreme i know a person who had been a uh, clean and tidy all his life mm -hmm. ended up dying on the bed having his stools on the bed urinating on the bed and the very fact that oh my god i have been so tidy and clean and i am doing this all mess killed the person
what is the lesson that we have to take here? Krishna also never get attached to some condition that the mind puts you into. Never get attached. When even if it is so called very much right, it is very good for health. This is how a person has to live, even if it is in, in that condition. Somehow you become so extreme about it, not applying empathy, empathetic attitude about this, and end up living in a complete opposite situation. <laughs> Krishna in a in a small story in Srimad Bhagavatam tells Narada um, that I snatch those objects, those people from my devotees whom he is attached to. <laughs> I've given a number of examples about the story, but still I'll again reiterate. So Krishna and uh, uh, Narada goes to a devotee's place. He is very poor. He has a cow. And milking the cow and giving to people was his, uh, you know, was his living. He, he did this for a living. And then when he came, when Krishna came, that fellow was very happy. He was, you know, jumping on his toes that Krishna has come. So all that he could provide was, was a small room in his place, you know. Perhaps a mat on the on the floor to lie down and a glass of milk. <laughs> and uh, the the next night Krishna and Narada leaves the house. Um, the 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 devotee was very happy, the poor fellow was very happy, yet he was uh, you know a bit uh, hesitant in in making him depart from his house. So he hugged him and then he prostrated unto him. Krishna blessed him uh, without any words mentally and then he left the place. Narada was asking, what did you bless him? He was very curious. What did you do for his blessing? I blessed him that let his cow die. <laughs> Narada was very anxious. What? You should have blessed him all wealth. You should have blessed him a good woman by his, you know, in his in his life, so that he she can take care of him, she can give him some kids or 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 create a family, you know. But Krishna was very strong. He said, No, oh, this is the only attachment he has. If he breaks that, then he will be completely absorbed unto me. So the problem is attachment. Now, why, why, why am I telling this? Raga and Dvesha, the basis of strong like and strong dislike is attachment. When you, when you have a list of priorities in life, they would always be opposite of them. The list of priorities would be your Raga. The opposite of them would be your Dvesha. You can't escape. Or you say, okay, I don't have attachments, but I just hate some of the things. It can't happen that way. <laughs> if you hate some things, it always means the opposite are completely strongly likable by yours. You know? So three and four the causes of miseries being Raga and Dvesha. And the fifth one is Abhinivesha. Abhinivesha, a strong attachment towards this life. How do you portray this Abhinivesha? It's very strong. People hardly portray this, but, but when put into a circumstance, you get to know, oh, that is how she is very clingy to life or fearing death, you know. This Abhinivesha, strong attachment to life, is revealed at certain circumstances like 
uh, when you're at the top of the mountain and somebody is trying to tickle you. You get angry. You get angry. Why are you doing this? <laughs> Aren't you sensible? You know? Or when you are put to that state where everything is being snatched from your life, you, know, you are thoroughly, thoroughly grief stricken. And you have this one hope that is, there would be something good that is happening. Do you mean to say, Lalita, that having hope in this life is wrong? Not, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying no to this, but I'm not literally mentioning the same. When you have high hopes about your life, that your life is going to be smooth, your life is going to be um, having all the gardens, colors, it's going to be end up nice with good people around. It's not going to be the same way. This is the hardest truth. You've seen people. You've seen nice, good people. And their deaths too, right? So what is going to be nice or what is going to be good in a lavatory? <laughs> How is it going to be good? This is very disheartening. You are making me depressed. No, I am giving you a reality check. This is how it is going to be. But the choice of happiness lies within you when you get entangled into the so-called image that you have created, the misapprehension, misapprehension that you have created about yourself that this is me, you're going to die. And death is going to be worse. It's going to be old age, disease, death. Or perhaps... You know, stool passing, urine passing in bed and death. No. But on the same hand, if your intellect chooses the infinite power that is that is arisen from within, and you identify yourself above as that powerful self, where is the worry? Where is the fear? Where did this attachment go? What happens when you are trying to climb a mountain with a group? When you are right at the foothills and looking at the mountain, you definitely feel this is not going to happen. <laughs> right. Right. But slowly, slowly, Within minutes, within hours, you feel like with a group, I can do this. And then slowly, slowly, five hours of climbing makes you feel that you're all the more energetic. And by around eight or nine hours, you're at the cliff. Right? It so happens. All the actions that you do in this impermanent life should be like this. With a definite attitude of, you know, motivating self-motivation and produce something good. It has to be creative enough. But not that, oh my God, I'm going to die. Am I going to live? Climbing five hours? No, my knees are going to die. My heart is going to, you know, burst. No? Not with this fear. So this is your life. Act of mountain climbing. And you know how it is going to end? You know. You are your own torch bearer, right? You know how to lead your life. 
So again, coming back to Patanjali's version of glaciers, five causes. Avidya, Asmita, Raga, Dvesha and Abhinivesha. Ignorance, ego, strong likes, strong hatred and attachment to life. All these are what? All these are not big ones. They are causes of your misery. They are the problem creators. They are the delusion makers. They make you impoverish. They taint you. They put you to the state of dismay. They are the troublemakers. Kalilam. That's the catchphrase. Yadate moha kalilam. Now you, Krishna gives you a choice. Are you going to attach yourself, get deluded, get tainted, or buddhif, buddhihi vyatitarishyati, or will you use your intellect to transcend? <laughs> he says, if at all you, you staunchly believe, that your understanding can transcend all these tainted beliefs, tainted delusions that your mind, the ego has created for you yourself. Or are you going to transcend? When you're ready to transcend all these, what, what is happening? Tada gantasi. Then you arrive. Where do you arrive? Nirvedam Vairagya Detachment So how he, he is giving an equation. People have been quite a number of times asking the same question. How do you detach yourself? How to have the strings and not have them? What is this pun that you are making with you? With your verbose, you know, it is not a pun. This is the equation he is giving. The intellect has two choices. One choice to get faultily strained by all those mental delusions, apprehend misapprehensions created by the ego that this body is me, this mind is me, the achievements are mine, these offsprings are mine. Husband, my husband. Uh, wife, my wife. Career, my career. Future, my future. Are you going to take up this choice? Or can the intellect sublimate itself to the state of self going inward? Understand that it is incapacitated to realize what really the self is and then the self starts to reveal itself. So we have two choices. When to take this choice? What is the best time to take up this choice? Let me just enjoy my... I am just 20s. I am just in my 20s. I have to live this world. I have to enjoy this world. Let me think about it in my 40s. 40s, I've just made up my house. Now I start to live in this house. You know, now I have my family sound and strong, stable. Now I have this liberty to go out, see places, you know, search for things what I can do. Should I take this choice at me in the 60s? Oh, yes, that is going to be good, a good decision. Let me take this choice in 60s and then postpone, keep postponing. Okay, what happens in the 60s? You're already diagnosed with number of <laughs> list of diseases and disorders. You're already popping medicines, uh, be it herbal, <laughs> Aurelia is here. Be it herbal or 
homeopathic or allopathic were already popping medicines. We know what are our limitations. And then with all those wounds stricken, all these 60 years, do you, do you think that the wounds have been milder? No. You are going to be tarnished. You are going to be tainted with all those wounds even more. The choice is right now. Right here. What is the choice? I have to transcend. I have to surrender the understanding of truth because now I do not know. Okay. For example, I start with a sadhana called japa sadhana. Close my eyes, do my japa, breathe in, breathe out. Every day, 20 to 30 minutes, I am before the Lord, you know, ringing the bell, doing all the puja, I am doing the japa, 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 japa. And when the moment comes, when the sorrow comes, when the misery hits us hard, uh, I get a phone call that some loved one is met with an accident. I am depressed. I am depressed. Worrying is not a problem. Anusho chanti na anusho chati. Worrying again and again is a problem. What had happened to that sadhana? Has gone into garbage. What does it mean? Japa didn't help. Yoga didn't help. Meditation didn't help. No. I was faking it. Why? Why am I faking it? I was faking it. Thinking that I am meditating. I am doing the Ramanama Japa. I am Chanting the name. I am purifying my soul. I am making efforts to master my mind. See what? What intensity of misapprehension can... This is how we are all. This is how we act. This is how the ego gets stronger and stronger. Makes us to attach more and more... Even attached to the sadhana, the fruits of the sadhana. I hear many people saying, I have been meditating for 23 years of my life. <laughs> no? See? The statements themselves reveal what and how we are. There is something called this mind produce. Hmm? What does the cattle feed produce? Milk, yogurt, cheese. <laughs> what does this mind produce do? Only garbage. And puts us to the fetters of birth and death. That's how we are bound. Now, do we have to kick this mind? out and become insane or become a coma patient. <laughs> no. No. It is just the other way around. What are all the body, mind that we have, the possessor, we are trying to find who is the knower. Who is knowing all these things? We have to find that. But what is our problem? We either have known or we know the unknown. <laughs> known is the past and the unknown is the future. Never we make efforts to know the knower. Who is the knower? When your eyes see, does the eyes know that eyes are seeing? 
No, they are inert objects. Eyes don't even realize that they see. Okay. There's a biological explanation. Eyes receive only signals. They, they make inverted images. They go to the brain. The brain is the knower. It inverts, inverts the image back and brings to the eye and then the vision happens. So the brain is the knower. Okay. What happens to a person who has sound brain and blind? What happens to a person whose eyes are open yet sleeping <laughs> like a horse? Huh? What happens to a person who is in coma? Which means there is an innate principle. The absolute existence, the causal state, the wholesomeness. When we align ourselves to that truth, the eternal truth, that indestructible self, we know the knower. We know that the brain, the neurons, the nerve, the, the neural pathways of, of the optic nerves and the eyes all are inert. All are just objects. All are just tools. The intellect Buddhihi vyati tarishyati. The intellect has to, has to opt the choice, opt for the choice. The choice is that you, you before, before mentioning the choice, how can a person assess which is not knowable, which is not accessible? How can the intellect, the mind, the eyes, ears, all sense organs put together, all the faculties put together, all those systems and organs that we've got, human, yet humans, very, very superhuman inside, all those put together. How can they ascertain which is inaccessible? We cannot. Why? Because we stay in a state which is not really us. And trying to find out who are we. It is like staying in Bucharest and then um, asking about the geographical locations of, of, of uh, Thargumurish. How can you do? How can you possibly do? Unless until you go there, you know what is TM, how it is, how the cities are, how the blocks are, how the roads are. Is there any mountain? Is there any river by the side? You have to be there, right? So we like to stay caged in this body, mind, revealing self which is not at all really truth which is completely false and then trying all the more to ascertain ourselves which is the wholesome one is always there which is indestructible which had been there before our birth <laughs> which will remain even after we die that is us but staying in case we are going, we are trying to ascertain that the only thing, the only thing, not through sadhana. I am not joking here. Not through yoga. Not through sadhana. You get to realize this only by ego surrender. You get to realize the unreal, unrealizable. 
because the self reveals kiranmayena paatrena satyasya apihitam mukam tattvam pooshann apavrun satya dharmaya drishtaye the sadaka as the self the supreme self remove the golden orb what is that orb what is that golden orb that we that we teach in surya namaskar as mantras that golden orb is our ignorance it is so golden it is so nice and glamorous is full of attractions the sadaka is asking the self to remove because he is unable <laughs> he is he is mentioning his you know incapacity you know what what do you call that hmm? he is mentioning his um uh, lack of skill to realize it all by himself even with his sadhana even at the edge of the sadhana so the only thing is self surrender ego surrender that's the intellect's choice however intelligent the intellect can be <laughs> it can either know shrotavyasya shrutasya cha it can either know that which is heard in the past shrutasya cha that which is unheard in the future even we can imagine things that are not known by us you know um we can make theories the entire quantum physics even physics even mathematics depends upon theories theories that we propose we didn't don't know really they are just they are just theories we can do that about future people say we have to be in the present in the in the now no i said it is in the every moment be every moment be every moment every moment be every moment be now how do you transcend the buddhi from all these mental afflictions and how do you surrender what is the which which thing that bridges the gap the bridges this gap is nirvedam vairagya detachment patanjali again gives a definition of vairagya दृष्टाश्रविक विषय विदृष्ण से वशीकार संज्ञा वैराग्य दीन दट विच इज हर्ड एंड अनहर्ड इज अगेन गिविंग द सेम सेम थिंग्स लाइक कृष्ण डा श्रोतव्य से श्रुत से च Hmm? all those object that you have seen you have heard and not heard you have to deploy distance emotional emotional distancing from those objects otherwise what happens oh you go to italy you will get that dessert that dessert is very relishing you know and then suddenly what happens you are in one village in in india and then you all the time focus about oh how i how am i going to reach italy and get that dessert that is no vairagya <laughs> you haven't heard about it you haven't seen that dish you haven't relish tasted it but still there is attachment see how far how strong the intensity of ego can be that can create raga towards the object which we haven't heard of the
Vashikaraha. You have to master your sense organs. How do you do that? Sanya, awareness. But being aware. What are you aware? I am aware that I am speaking. I am aware that I am listening. I am aware that I am reading. No. You are not speaking. You are not listening. You are not reading. All the tools are doing its property. The knower is you. He does not need Bhagavad Gita to realize himself. <laughs> he is you. That is you. That awareness. Am I confusing you all or am I clear? <laughs> That nirvedam vairagya is the gap that bridges for the intellect to choose the right path. The intellect to choose the right path is to surrender that I do not know anything. Of all the sadhanas that I've been doing to realize the self, I will fail. Because of the very nature that I reside in this body. The very state of I is completely different in my perception. How can you wake a person who is acting to sleep? We have intentionally, with all our willpower, blinded ourselves. We don't want to perceive because we like to be caged in this I-ness in the body and the mind. We have caged ourselves. We have blinded ourselves. Who can help? A guru can help. No guru can help. Guru like Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh cannot help. That's what Ashtavakra Samhita says. Ashtavakra Gita. Guru Ashtavakra himself says, one who has blinded his perception completely and doesn't want to listen to Guru at Satanga. He doesn't want to listen to reading of, uh, you know, he doesn't want to um, read the Shastras and understand Guru Vakya. Even the gods Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, come down and give them the message, the Upadesha. They will not open their eyes. Why? We don't like to have a new perception. I am happy being stale. <laughs> I want you to read this one. I, I'll read, just, just listen to this. Buddhi reposes in the self. Here, you no more need external sources of knowledge. Any sadhana, any Bhagavad Gita reading or something. Nor anything to be heard from the word or shastras or any scripture. All that you have learnt and heard which prescribes various rites, becomes obsolete. There remains nothing to learn anew. You have touched the source. You have arrived at the state beyond knowledge and ignorance. This is the terminus. This is the terminus. This is the the last point, the ultimate portal, where you have crossed the border of moha, attachment and delusions. And there is no more shoka, no more misery for you. You are beyond the triad of knower, known and the knowing. 
your pure awareness. You are the enlightened being. Established in the unshakable luminosity of self. Somehow I thought I should read the statements and it becomes very perfect, sometimes powerful. I think I'll rest here. I'll conclude with one, one single line meaning of the shloka. Yada te moha kalina buddhi vyati tarishyati tada gantasi nirvedam shrotavyasya cha shrotavyasya cha When your understanding transcends the delusions created by the ego tada gantasi then you shall gain indifference, vairagya, nirvedam, detachment to those which have been heard and yet to be heard. Thank you. Questions, please.